Yes. You can start the slides, to Sindhi. Uh, welcome, friends. Uh, this is our tenth webinar of Indian Arthroscopy Society. Uh, it's an interesting topic today. So, what we are going to talk is something which is uh, not done very frequently in India. It's ankle arthroscopy, and we do have masters of uh, ankle arthroscopy uh, in this webinar, along with uh, esteemed international faculty. Uh, we have Dr. Sundar Rajan. He's from Coimbatore. He does excellent ankle arthroscopy work. Uh, Dr. Kaushal Nag is a leading uh, ankle arthroscopic surgeon in the country. Dr. Satish Sonar has got uh, extensive uh, experiences in ankle arthroscopy. Dr. Samantha, our uh, secretary of the Indian Arthroscopy Society, uh, has a immense experience in uh, ankle arthroscopy. So these are four Indian masters of ankle arthroscopy who are going to take us through the program. We also are lucky that we have two international speakers and both of them are themselves master in the techniques of ankle uh, uh, treatment and ankle arthroscopy. Dr. Kim Tan, he is uh, expert in ligament reconstructions of ankle and Dr. Mark Blackney from Australia is a wonderful guy. He, uh, he does a lot of work in ankle impingement. I think with this introduction, let us uh, move to our first talk where we have Dr. Sundar Rajan, who actually takes us through the journey of ankle arthroscopy portals, set up diagnostic ground and uh, anterior ankle impingement. Dr. Sundar. Yeah. yeah. Can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. OK. OK, so my talk is on about ankle arthroscopy portals um, and uh, anterior impingement. So the wearable, you can do an ankle arthroscopy. The indications, the most one of the most common indication is the OCDs, that osteochondral defects of the talus, sometimes in the tibia. Of course, in the traumatic situations where you want to do a nerve fracture, you want to see the articular cartilage in intra-articular fractures, still is, still is an option. If the synovitis, if it is not responding to the conservative management, still you can do a synovectomy and biopsy in inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, or soft tissue impingement due to uh, anterior talofibular ligament or anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, which can cause anterolateral impingement. You can do a bony impingement in the footballers or uh, uh, with the spurs, and sometimes loose bodies are in. It also help can do an arthroscopic assisted ankle fusions, and sometimes it helps you in the, even the stiffness of the ankle, like any other joint. It is a very good tool, and uh, arthroscopy helps you to uh, with the minimal morbidity you can increase the ankle movements. What anesthesia to use? If you are using a decade, they can use a general anesthesia. But in my experience, I use a regional anesthesia because usually I discharge on the next day to make the patient more comfortable. Comfort, coming to the positioning, like in the supine position, you can always use a well leg holder like what you use in the knee so that the leg won't roll too much. But make sure that uh, your foot is free, at least around 20 centimeters from the tip of the table so that you can move the ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion freely. And also you should, all, it should, should allow the flex the knees. And, if you, and by giving this 20 centimeter, it allows you to move from all the direction from the medial lateral direction or behind the patient. Whether to use pump, no, not necessary because already it's a very small joint and the gravitational flow system is more than sufficient for an ankle arthroscopy. I use only manual traction. Many surgeons uh, use manual traction, but few surgeons use still mechanical distractor. It has got some own advantages and disadvantages. I mean, some of them use uh, fixed uh, traction. Some of them use uh, this kind of uh, uh, straps and uh, tie, it, uh, tie it over their waist and pull it for the traction. But I usually use assistance to pull it up. So that, I, that is more convenient for me because when I use the strap, I am not comfortable. And if you use excessive traction, that can result in some injuries, so which you have to be very careful. What kind of scope can I use? I think standard 4mm scope is more than sufficient for most kind of activities if you are doing anterior to the joint. But you have to decide whether you're doing an anterior scopy or posterior scopy. Anything you are dealing with the posterior of the uh, talus, 
then you should do a posterior arthroscopy then if you already decide preoperatively it is easy to do use a forearm scope but i would recommend to keep the 2.7 uh, mm uh, all the instruments scope and instruments because when you have a tight joint and especially when you have andromedial ocds and everything it is very difficult to use the bigger instrumentation so you need a smaller instrumentation for ankle arthroscopy when it comes to the portal placement and the anteromedial portal placement is just lateral to the between the medial malleolus and the medial to the tibialis anterior you will have a depression that is you can see this hole here so easily you can um, uh, you use the uh, easily palpable if you are using anterolateral portal you are just going lateral to the peroneal tertius and superficial peroneal nerve and clinically you will be able to see the superficial peroneal uh, nerve in all the time so it is easy to uh, go lateral to that so that avoid injury to the superficial peroneal nerve so this is how you start your joint you make a mark on both medial portal and the lateral portal i would recommend to inflate the joint for initial days so that it is easy for your scope to go inside because it's a very tight joint not like a big volume joint in the knee so you can in inject uh, 10 to 20 ml of fluid and you can use the scope uh, here better to use the and it's only to do the stab incision and use the mosquito forceps to open into the joint and scope better to use a short lever arm because some other scopes are which will have a longer lever arm like a striker and all we have a shorter lever arm scopes so that is easy and more convenient to use and rotate uh, this is how you use the short uh, scope once you go inside the joint inside the joint then you'll be able to uh, see the uh, both uh, tibio tala joint what you see down is the talus we can see the night convex surface what you see upper surface is the tibia and you are seeing in the seeing through the medial side and this is the syndesmosis of the ankle joint and you can see the white structure and uh, here that is the anterior inferior tibio fibular ligament and you see the lateral gutter over there the once you see the syndesmosis and the anterior inferior tibia fibular ligament you see the posterior joint what you see the white structure is the deep portion of the tibio fibular ligament posterior tibio fibular ligament other is called transverse ligament normally the joint doesn't open like this because this is an uh, uh, lax joint due to uh, uh, lax joint with uh, anterolateral instability that's why i could able to see the posteriorly very well but otherwise you will not be able to see this much opening in normal ankle joint so just for demonstration purpose i took this video but in the normally you will not be able to see this clearly about the posterior capsules and the uh, but you will be able to see the transverse ligaments easily the once you see inspects your lateral half of the talar dome and the tibia you come to the medial side and the medial side you can see that the capsule you see that movement over there that is the flexor hallucis longus you can see that by moving the toe you'll be able to elicit the flexor hallucis longus even you can see from the front if the lax joint is there then you go on the medial side the medial talar the dome and tibia is all right then you go further you see the medial malleolus and medial gutter and the deltoid ligaments you will be able to see on the uh, medial side and sometimes you'll be able to see this in another video which you can see that is the talus what you see the upper surface is the tibia when you when you see an a uh, uh, bone that is the tibia and then this is the talus and in the you can come down uh, you can see all around the talus up to the non articular surface you see here you can see up to the talar navicular you can go around up to the talar navicular joint if you want to do anything on the talus over there coming to the posterior uh, scopy again the position is in the prone position make sure again the same kind of uh, space between the table and the foot so that it allows for you free movement for the portals you mark the tendinosus on either side then mark the lateral malleolus and mark the tip of the lateral malleolus the tip of the lateral malleolus corresponds to the uh, tendinosus that is the portal for the posterolateral portal and that is the posteromedial portal but this can go up and down depending upon the position for surgery what you do if you are doing a hanglin scope excision you can go down bit or if you are doing an ankle scope you can go a little higher and uh, your posterolateral portal you should point towards you can see the stab incision and uh, that mark shows the first web space that should be the aim when you make your portal so make a stab incision uh, over the posterolateral portal start with the posterolateral portal close to the tendinosus don't go too far away and uh, for the posteromedial portal again close to the uh, tendinosus usually it will be there we will be ending with meeting with a lot of fibrous tissues so usually it's a blunt procedure so you should artery forceps and open up everything in the fatty tissues and you can introduce the instruments like this you can go and touch the scope slide down come in front of the scope then you will be able to see the posterior joint and uh, as i said once you clear the fatty tissues you will be able to see when you are going in the medial side 
what do you say seeing that white structure in the medial side is the flux sarcolysis is longest that is a lighthouse and you should not go beyond medially you know i'm not going more videos on that i think kushal is going to cover when it comes to the anterior the compression of the structures of the anterior margin of the tibio talar joint during dorsiflexion it could be a soft tissue or an ics component the when you come to the soft tissue impingement in the anterolateral side the most common are due to post traumatic fibrous spans there's a post traumatic conditions you will have a lot of uh, uh, stiffness and arthrofibrosis in especially in the lower tibia fractures you have a plafond fractures intraarticular fractures there is a the case where you can go and do the arthrolysis you can have a sometimes anterior inferior tibio fibular joint with the dorsiflexes it comes and impinges you can just remove that anterior inferior tibio fibular ligament or uh, sometimes hypertrophic synovium or sometimes uh, superficial fascicles of atfl when it comes to the bony impingement usually it comes is due to the repetitive impact from the post dorsiflexion spurs it's called the footballer's an ankle all of you know that resulting in tear of anterolateral capsule and resulting in mechanical instability later on leads to cartilage lesions too in the early stages usually patient presents with only anterior ankle pain it could be elicited with the long periods of exercises and it can be relieved with the rest but in chronic cases patient may come have with the limited ankle motion that is in dorsiflexion because of the bony impingement as you see in this x ray when you do hyper dorsiflexion these spurs can come and touch each other and that will give you that will block and give the pain weight bearing x rays will be very helpful in this and make sure that when you do try to do a surgery for anterior impingement make sure that the joint space is reasonably preserved you should be careful that if the patient has got extensive arthritis if you do only impingement surgery that patient may not be happy when it comes to the soft tissue impingement we already told uh, about the uh, disrupted anterior atfl that can cause the hypertrophy and thickening and can have a impingement in the medial side you can have a sometimes thickening of the anterior medial capsule that can have impingement that is very rare in my practice in that doesn't mean that all the cases has to be operated immediately you can try all the conservative manner of modalities which have been described many patients will be improving with uh, footwear or the rest or the steroid injections they may go off but if they don't improve then you can go for a surgery before surgery especially on the lateral side we have to make sure that these patients have any associated pathologies like uh, osteochondral lesions lateral ankle instability or peroneal pathology sometimes you can have a combined uh, problems so that has to be addressed that the examination is crucial for all these uh, problems so this is a 45 years old male patient had a synovial hypertrophy as you see here there is a big synovium in the front of the joint over there that limits the motion that also uh, a lot of painful not improving with the conservative management you can see that a lot of synovial tissue in the all around the gutter and also in the front of the joint and you see this video the synovium it just goes and and gets caught between attaches to the tibia so this is the talus and that is a tibia so the synovium is uh, impinging uh, with uh, with with each movement so this kind of patients will improve with the synovectomy not only that helps you to get the bio, uh, get the pain relief and the bio, um, diagnosis it also helps to relieve the all the injury impingement pain here definitely you need a smaller uh, system sometimes because when you have a tight joints you cannot uh, go into the gutter on the posteriorly and the bony impingement principles make sure that you are removing all the spur which which is touching on the dorsiflexion and you have should you should use the radiograph during surgery that is very very important this is a 28 years old male uh, had a presented with the trauma but he is not a footballer is a traumatic patient he had a he had a injury to the talus treated this is the residual symptoms he had a impingement and pain you can see the big spur over the talus and uh, you can see on the uh, uh, healed talus fracture in the mri scan this is the arthroscope which you can see the big spur over the uh, talus and you can just you can use a small osteotome a uh, 5 mm osteotome you can uh, excise the uh, spur over the distal tibia at the same time you can see there is a big spur over the talus this is almost in the non nearing the non articular surface so that has to be removed to remove all the impingement at the end of the procedure by removing all the debris the spur which is over the talus sometimes with involving the lot of articular cartilage you may need to end up doing a micro fracture uh, for these patients to get uh, uh, a clinical improvement but i this patient is almost it's a 5 years before which i did is doing very well still so this is how you do intraoperatively you mark it with a pin uh, and make sure that you are not removing the normal bone even though you are doing seeing arthroscopically you need a image for each step to remove the spur on both tibia and the talus at the end you can see the completely uh, complete removal of the spurs on the both the side 
Sometimes you can have an anteromedial impingement due to multiple loose fragments. It could be due to an osteochondral lesion also. So this is a osteochondral lesion with the loose bodies. So you can on the medial side, or it cause secondary impingement. They have a synovitis too. So this pain initially you do a synovectomy to remove all the soft tissue impingement. Then with the small pieces along with the OCD fragment, osteocartilage fragment like that can be removed. And in this case, it underwent a microfracture for the complete relief. That is the final X-ray picture. And as I finally, uh, I said about arthrofibrosis, it's a very good tool. Here you can use a shaver and also I feel ablator is a very, very helpful because they're all like uh, fib very fibrous thick structure, like a bone. So you need a uh, ablator or cut, uh, to remove all the fibrous bands. You can see that's completely stiff, attaching to the both tibia and talus. Here, the, it helps you to remove all the fibrous tissues and regain the movements. To conclude, ankle impeachment, both anterior and posterior pathology, I think posterior is going to cover by uh, next speaker. So anterior impingement usually associated with the dorsiflexion, posterior is with the plantar flexion. All the symptomatic chronic cases can be managed successfully by arthroscopy. Make sure that you are ruling out other associated in pathologies like instabilities and osteoarthritis before arthroscopy and associated conditions should be addressed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sundar. Uh, indeed, that was a very illustrative talk and uh, you actually touched on uh, very good silent points about uh, how exactly to set up your theater and do an ankle arthroscopy. Uh, two quick questions before we go to the next presentation. The questions have started coming in. Uh, Sundar, the question is how to prevent an synovial fistula to happen in an ankle arthroscopy? Uh, there are chances of synovial fistula to happen in ankle arthroscopy. I never had uh, any synovial fistula in my experience. Really, I'm not sure how to prevent it, but... Uh, so can we just ask uh, some faculty member? I can ask other faculty, maybe Mark. Or... Mark, if you can tell us, or Kim, or maybe... Uh... Uh, I always uh, so, uh, stitch the wound, and that's very helpful. Yeah. yeah. But there is a small incidence every now and again. Uh, so the best way is uh, to... I guess, to stop over activities early on. So you need to non-weight bear for two or three days until the skin has had time to heal and yep. you seal the wound correctly. Yep. That's my best prevention. Yeah, so it has to be a padded dressing and uh, maybe a less weight bearing for a couple of days, two, three days, yes. and then uh, start uh, activities. Exactly. Uh, number two question here is... Uh, Ankle neuroma in the front of ankle uh, at the uh, site of portal. So you demonstrated how exactly you enter. So if you can just tell steps to avoid any uh, superficial nerve injury and neuromas in the anterior uh, ankle. If at all it happens, mostly it happens in the superficial peroneal nerve because it has got a two, three branches. It has got some variations too. So as I said, I showed in that clinical photograph, most often you will be able to see it. So I better to do the draw the diagram like any other arthroscopy. I want you to mark the tibialis anterior. You mark the medial malleolus, mark the lateral malleolus, and also peroneal stresses with the superficial peroneal nerve. So that easily you can avoid the super peroneal nerve. Perfect. And also you can make your I, 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 yeah. don't put the your knife very deeply. Make sure that only stab incision only to the skin and use the mosquito. Again, that will also avoid the nerve. Uh, number three question here is that uh, there are a lot of patients which come with uh, recurrent ankle swellings, and uh, how can we you be sure that this is and anterior ankle impingement because MRI shows edema, swelling, and synovitis. How can you be sure that there is a tissue there which is hypertrophied and your scopy will help the patient? Yeah, yeah. If, unless it's a, a clinical and MRI proven, I don't put my arthroscopy for a, just showing edema or a, some other effusion. So you have to be very careful between the effusion and the synovial tissue. I think the very good the MRI can, clar we can uh, clearly demonstrate which is synovial uh, tissue, which is the fluid collection. If there is a fluid collection, you may not be doing much inside the joint most of the time, then that patients may not be happy. That could be due to just a uh, rheumatoid patient on early stages, or it could be an osteoarthritis patient. Uh, so if the patients, unless you have an isolated uh, ankle synovial hypertrophy, not responding to the conservative management, and MRI proven it's a synovial hypertrophy, then I do an arthroscopic synovectomy and do a biopsy. So that patients will have a very good relief. So MRI proven has to be there uh, before you... And just a last question before we go to our next presentation, though it's an overlap between your and Kaushal's presentation, the question is that if you are dealing with case like multiple loose bodies, which you showed, uh, like in knee, we do anterior arthroscopy, but loose bodies might go in the back of the knee. 
how does it happen in ankle uh, do we combine in such cases anterior and posterior arthroscopy as well or anterior is good enough to remove all the loose body uh, 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 to to be honest i i have not removed very single simple loose bodies in the ankle joint not uh, i mean you don't have the osteochondromatosis what you see in the knee you don't see an ankle much but sometimes you will have a impingement with the loose bodies that can be clearly seen whether in the anterior side or in the posterior side so it will be very clearly known where is a loose body you don't go that much on anterior and posterior but as i said suppose if you have that kind of situation always you have enough foot space so you can easily you can go back to the you can put a posterior lateral portal easily and you can take it out so you can switch your scope to the posterior side perfect so how often do do you need to go anterior posterior in your experience of maybe how many cases you have done how often would you very 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 rare because you know the diagnosis you, okay. you know the pathology perfect. is an anterior side perfect. or a posterior side uh, any other input from any other faculty here about uh, combining an, an anterior and posterior arthroscopy in a single case i think uh, we are caution i would agree with uh, sundar it's not very often it happens because uh, before you go into the ot and you position and you plan you make sure that uh, you have a plan right you make sure and you want, you know what you want to do uh, and in the ankle is very tight joint so usually if you have a lot of if you have loose bodies anteriorly is unlikely that one of them is slip behind and uh, go into the retrocalcaneal in the retrocalcaneal bursa space but however if you do have there is always a, a, a pre operative decision to do anterior first or posterior later and vice versa but in my limited experience i have never had to do uh, a uh, posterior anterior in the same setting is usually that you you are pretty sure what you want to do before you uh, anesthetize the, the the patient so dr tan and uh, dr mark i mean if you can add something on on, uh, on this uh, or you agree with all this i occasionally, I occasionally do anterior and posterior when yeah, okay. uh, when there is dual pathology and there has to be dual significant pathology. but okay. um so if they have an ostrogonum plus an osteo anterior osteochondral lesion they're both symptomatic and always i start i do it in one sitting but i start with the patient in the prone position and then i roll them back supine and re uh, re sterilize for anterior but it's Perfect. it's a very it's a very calculated decision it's not a decision that you would make uh, on the uh, on the day great yeah, i think i would uh, agree with that yeah yeah tam also agrees with that wonderful i think uh, good uh, uh, experienced uh, program which uh, sundar has shown uh, regarding an anterior ankle arthroscopy i think posterior ankle impingement is also common to detect it and how exactly to manage i think let's uh, hear it from dr koshal now koshal if you can share your presentation yeah Yeah, can you can you see my uh, screen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me just uh, pull this up. And, uh, okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, posterior impingement, and uh, before we go into uh, the details of the talk, so I've got a I made a very basic talk uh, because I'm aware that in India. a lot a very few people very few of us actually do ankle arthroscopy on a daily basis so i'd like to keep it simple so that our viewers can have a basic idea of how to go in and what to look for uh, in a posterior impingement um starting with the, the first slide uh, what what, uh, what is posterior impingement is is known by various different names it could be the ostrigonum syndrome or the posterior tibiotibial compression syndrome various names but remember one thing uh, impingement doesn't necessarily mean always a piece of bone it can also mean soft tissues or various other rare pathologies that you may have including maybe a low lying fhl or fhl cyst which might give symptoms of post impingement so before you think of bone keep in mind that it can also involve a lot of soft tissue components also uh so what is the major major cause of post impingement i think the major cause is a bone impingement and it could be due to two two uh, two various very related pathologies it's either the stider process or the ostrigonum stider process is when the it's a posterior extension of the posterior lateral process of the the talus when it unites when it unites in bony fusion with the talus uh, stider process and when it doesn't and it is connected to the talus by synchondrosis we call it a ostrigonum so it's basically the same pathology with a different name uh an ostrigonum is occasionally found in 7 to 14% of cases in in people 
and remember it's not only about the bony tissues the capsule soft tissue is also involved along with certain other uh, ligaments of the posterior capsule like the posterior talofibular the intermalleolar ligaments which may also contribute to the impingement process uh, per se in 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 the in the in the index patient so this is basically a schematic diagram what it looks like if you have if you see the the ostrigonum or the sider process you will see it has a lot of ligamentous attachments the intermalleolar the posterior talofibular a lot of other ligaments which are connected uh which together would give rise to the posterior impingement complex in a way so it's basically a clinical diagnosis so if you would ask me uh, what is your decision to go for a surgery i would say 80% of the decision to go for a surgery would be a, the clinical diagnosis so uh, it's basically hyper plantar flexion causing pain right or sometimes even pain on movement rapid movement in flexion and dorsiflexion and extension because remember It is also the compression and distraction distraction forces of the injured tissues, which also can give rise to pain. So, and it's typically pain posterior to the ankle joint, but anterior to the Achilles. So, very, uh, very, very, very uh, simple. If you ask your uh, patient to tell you where does it hurt, he can exactly point with his index finger and tell you this is where it hurts, and it should correlate with your clinical examination. So, having said that, do I do any investigations? Yes, of course I do. I do a basic X-ray study, the AP and lateral view. the ap view of course doesn't help so it's mostly the lateral view which helps me see the size of the bone impingement or whether there is an ostrigonum or sider process sometimes it may be difficult to visualize the actual size of the ostrigonum or the sider process but a lateral radiograph with 25 degrees of external rotation may overcome this problem and i'll and i'll tell you why because if you look at the actual cut of the of the level of the ankle joint this is how it looks like so the axis of the talus is not it's not it's not 90 degrees to the lateral view right so if you can external rotate a bit you can have a bang lateral profile of the posterior lateral process and the ostrigonum so this is exactly what it would look like so it's the same x ray in a uh, lateral view and a uh, lateral view with 25 degrees of external rotation so some of the smaller um, stider processes ostrigonums you can underestimate the size right i mean you may not miss it but underestimate the size if you don't do x ray in external rotation so once you know that the bony piece is there Uh, do you do a mr yes i do a mr the reason is i would like to I would love to confirm my diagnosis and exclude any other pathology that may be present in the posterior part of the ankle joint remember i told you about it could be a facial cysts there could be a low lying facial there could be some other rare things which can give which can mimic uh, the diagnosis of posterior impingement it has happened to me so i do an mr to figure out exactly if there's anything else that i need to look out for and uh, this is exactly what a uh, mr Uh, sagittal view would tell you in uncomplicated cases you have a uh, uh, bone edema in the synchondroses with a lot of bony edema in the soft tissues and you know you're dealing with a uh, sort of a soft tissue bony complex contributing to ankle impingement and most of the patients who would really come to you for treatment usually athletes so they would usually also have some amount of anti impingement too so the scan would also show uh, if there's any anti impingement uh, in the same patient too so what are the treatment options i i don't mean to say that um, you need to go in and uh, do a surgery the first time the patient comes and visits you usually i would tell them to isolate modify the activities maybe try a local steroid injection uh, under the cm in the in the opd or something like that but usually 80% of those who would coming to me would be athletes so they are very very focused they would say this is the problem i need to get rid of it so let's do it so arthroscopic resection and uh, and is and and a wash out of the joint really produce good symptomatic and functional results in many of the resistant cases who don't respond to physiotherapy and other acti activity modifications so is usually prone like sunda short uh, i i have a different take on uh, how do you um, draw the portal so i i think it's a lot about ankle osteoscopy is a lot about lines right so a few lines would tell you exactly where you are and where you need to be I think the most important line is the line you draw flush to the tip of the lateral malleolus. You can use your uh, use your uh, flexible ruler, or you can use your uh, probe on table to draw this line. And this line loops out over medially also. So this is in this continues from the tip of the lateral malleolus to the Achilles and loops over and continues uh, along the medial side as well. So once you have drawn this line, you know the exact level at which you need to go in, and then you draw the borders of the Achilles like Sundar very nicely showed, and the both the posterior lateral and posterior medial portals are bang medial and lateral to the achilles at this level of the line 
So if you have once you have done that, you know you are you are in the right place. And once you make the lateral portal like Sundar showed, you you are inside the skin. You take a mosquito. You 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 uh, enlarge the portal, go deep, and make sure that your um, uh, that your artery is pointing towards the first web space because that's where you need to look for with the scope. So that's the medial portal I was talking about. Be very careful. Don't go too much too much medial because then you will be uh, too near the neurovascular bundle and the tibial nerve. So I wouldn't want that to happen. So stay flush medial and just above the line that we have already drawn. And if you look carefully, you realize that that line which is just parallel, just it kisses the tip of the lateral malleolus is actually quite below the tip of the medial malleolus, right? So make sure that you know this line doesn't. Touch the medial malleolus medially, which would mean that you are your medial portal would be a bit too superior. So keep that in mind when you draw the line. So once you have done that, and and I and I would comment Sundar on this very nice slide that he showed when he does the triangulation. Your your medial uh, your lateral portal, which is the viewing portal, the troca goes in, and for the medial portal, you put your mosquito or your shaver, and you hit the scope, and you gently go down and track along the scope. And once you have triangulated. You either start shaving or you can use your uh, uh, artery and start spreading. And what you actually need to do is to <clears throat> make a rent in the crural fascia because unless you, unless otherwise you do that, you will only see a white screen, a white screen on the on the scope, right? You won't see much. So once you have done a shaving a bit or you have spread it out with the with the with your artery, you'll see this rent. And through this rent, you if you are in the right place, you will see the subtalar joint. So once you have done this, you know. 90% of your job is over. So you're, you're there at the right place. So it's now a matter of going in, shaving, being, being a bit patient and you know, doing whatever you went in to do. So identifying the, the, the ostrigonum or the stider is not a very difficult job. You can see right in front of your eyes. So you see this is the subtalar joint below and the ankle joint above and in between you have the stider process. It's very simple. So once you have uh, diagnosed the stider process, you have seen, you've seen the stider process of the cause of the impingement. A few other things that you need to watch out for in posterior scopy is look out for the, the FHL, right? That's the first thing that you should be trying to identify because you would need to limit your movement lateral to it, right? You don't want to go medial to it. So the flexor halosis is, is a very important tendon. I need to identify it and keep medial to it because lateral to it and, and keep lateral to it, sorry, because medial to it, you have the neurovascular bundles. So once you see the FHL and you can confirm by moving your uh, great toe and you see the FHL there, Please stick, stay lateral to it, and you can, and just medial to it, and you see those uh, fatty tissue. That's where the neurovascular bundles is. Having said that, you can go beyond the FHL. I mean, you can go lateral and beyond to identify various other structures uh, further anteriorly. But that's not the topic for today's talk. Uh, so let's keep it simple. So once you identify the FHL, keep lateral to it, keep shaving, clear out, and then you can tease out the the synchondrosis or the cider process either by a shaver, which I, which I think is a bit of a tedious process. You, you keep shaving, there's a lot of bone dust coming out, takes a lot of time. Or the more easier ones like uh, Sundar showed, will be to take in your uh, 5M osteotome, uh, tease, tease out the synchondrosis or the, or the cider process there and hammer it out so that you can extract it as, as a whole, whole piece through the medial portal. And once you've done that, you're mostly fine and you can actually uh, move your ankle up and down and see under the scope whether to, to see there is any other uh, impeachment that is left. In the process of removing the, the, the stider process, remember you also have to disinsert all the ligaments which are attached there. So you can and you, you should be able to disinsert the posterior telofibular ligaments if you have to take it out as a free piece. So what are the concerns of posterior arthroscopy? The, I think the two major concerns are not to injure the neurovascular bundles uh, medially and the pseudal love naturally. <coughs> the most important uh, step is actually before you start the surgery. So if you have marked out your portals correctly, if you have got to the same level and you have you flush to the, to, the, to the Achilles, you are safe. So once you have made the portal and gone in, you're already on your way to do the surgery. So before you do that, be careful. So anatomic studies have shown that the posterior medial portal is around 7.5 mm away from the tibial nerve. And the postural lateral portal around 6 mm away from the pseudal nerve. So you have, so you don't have a very wide uh, margin of safety, but it's enough if you are careful, right? So, what are the complications? Um, what are the chances of complications, right? I mean, in the hands of masters, of course, uh, it's quite less. 
So in the hands of masters, you for you, you generally have complication published rates of 8.5, and even Van Dyke says it's 2.3. But uh, if you are if you follow the steps and if you don't uh, if you mark correctly, I don't think it's a big concern. Don't be too afraid of uh, going in and looking for uh, pathology inside. So I will finish my talk here. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Kaushal. Wonderful talk. Uh, you thank gave you, a very nice. Uh, overview of a posterior ankle impingement and uh, especially uh, ostrigon uh, two three questions here uh, first to you and then open to all the panelists number one are there any tips to be sure that you have removed uh, entire uh, osteochondrosis i mean uh, of course it's quite tape, uh, can you find a plane there or how is it exactly so so, so so there are two points to your question so yeah uh, if you are looking for a plane or Remember, I did a MR scan before, so I know yeah, yeah. the synchondrosis or a stider process. Uh -huh. so synchondrosis is quite simple. You can actually go in with your curved rongia or your or your curved osteotome, and you can actually actually tease it out. So you know you can, you're feeling soft tissue, and you can tease it out. Or and if it's a stider process and it's ossified, you can actually go in and tap 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 hammer it out. So it's quite simple actually because you're actually doing it under vision. You're not mm -hmm. you don't need a CM or anything to to figure out the level or the or the, or the plane rather. Uh, another question: How often would you also combine a subtalar arthroscopy? Would you go into subtalar just have a look, everything, or every time you would do it? No, I wouldn't do that. Only if there's an indication for that, I would. Otherwise, I wouldn't. Uh, Sundar, anything you want to add? Maybe Samantha or Mark? Uh, would you do a uh, have a look at subtalar also? No, I don't. We don't do it. Osteogram, we don't do it. Perfect. Because in the clinical diagnosis, we know that beforehand that your your subtalar joint is not painful. Perfect. Young people, perfect. there is no mostly, point. That... Mostly in uh, osteogenom or posterior lateral impingement, uh, the subtalar joint is rarely involved. So rarely involved. No... Perfect. Yes, young perfect. people, subtalar is not involved at all. Yeah, there are two more questions which are coming in. Number one is uh, basically it's for you, Sundar. I mean, uh, there are fancy traction devices which are available. Uh, would you actually recommend them to buy those traction devices for ankle arthroscopy? Yeah. Unmute yourself, Sundar. Unmute, unmute yourself, Sundar. Unmute, unmute. Sundar, you are not audible. You are not audible. Sundar, you are not audible, please. Yes, Sundar. Yeah, yeah. Unmute. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. See, it's, it's. I. I felt, in my opinion, it's very cumbersome. It will not allow you to move freely here and there, and you need to just hold your foot and to do a plantar flexion, give a slight traction with your assistant. It is easy to do the traction. So I don't because many other time. You will be requiring to operate. If you are operating 90 degree side, you'll be operating in 90 degree to the joint or the medial or lateral. You need to do a traction too much. So unless you are doing a intramedial OCDs, then you may need to do a traction. At that time, you are by even manual traction is more than sufficient in my experience. No, uh, just to jump in. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. No worries, Koshat. Please. I don't think you will ever need a traction uh, unless and until maybe you're trying to do an ankle fusion, right? Because when you have to walk. A so lot we will of, talk about it once uh, yeah, Samantha tells me. I will show you the trick how, how to do yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, uh, so so this is a question which is common. I mean, which is the sport which you commonly see where you you said a lot of sportsmen come with posterior impingement. So which is the sport in India which is uh, you see? soccer, mostly soccer, but a lot of badminton players also come. So Mark, I mean, you see in sportsmen or you also see in ballet dancers and uh, in your country? Mark. Uh, we have many uh, footballers. Okay. We have uh, ballet dancers and sprinters. So all these and three. Occasionally we have uh, cricketers. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. 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 And uh, the final yeah. question here is: uh, uh, Would you always operate on these patients, or would you just give maybe steroid injections, give them a bracing, and try to avoid a posterior uh, surgery? I mean, it's a so it's maybe, surgery uh, which is not for everybody. Uh, yeah. You rightly said the. Uh, the areas of neurovascular are pretty close by. Those who are beginning to do ankle arthroscopy are afraid of it. So if they find a patient and they diagnose it the way you actually told them to diagnose, right. how much is the role of conservative therapy in such patients? So conservative, of course, uh, there is a role for it. I mean, I wouldn't say that there is no role. There is a significant role for it. Usually when you have a, have a sportsman coming to you uh, or activity modification is something that they cannot do, right? So they will be yeah. taking analgesics and icing and carry on with it. So if this person coming to is not a sportsman, then of course the, 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 the scope for avoiding a surgery is bigger. So I can okay. ask him to change his sport, for example. If he's a footballer, I can ask him to take up swimming or cycling and icing, reducing the level of activity. Maybe if he's running for one, one hour, ask him to do it for half an hour, twice a day or something like that. But 
usually the sportsman or the person who would say, I will need a surgery because I cannot do any activity modification. Steroid injection is something that I can and often do, but um, depends on what, 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 what is the patient profile. You know, an athlete usually ends up with a surgery. Uh, any other uh, faculty who wants to add on conservative therapy? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think Pratik yes. wants to speak something. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that. You know, you said uh, there was a question about distractors, you know, the different kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. factors. Uh, I don't know, uh, Sundar will also be able to comment. There is a help which is available if you kind of, uh, you know, there are two positions, putting one supine, and one is hanging the foot at the end of the table, uh, you know, 90 degrees from the knee, in which case the gravity actually also helps you and just a little bit of a pressure can give you you know, just a gentle pull on the calcaneum so can give any you... of the yes. faculty here would do a hanging ankle arthroscopy, something which is uh, cautious. Mm, if I can, no, I, I, I don't really ever use traction. Oh, okay, I don't ever. Uh, but is it your assistant assist who is pulling it sometimes when you need to give some? Sometimes work? I have a little, uh, I put the traction uh, strap on and ask someone to pull, only but, but it's only very rare. Okay, if you find if you put a little bump under the calf and you plan to flex the foot, you can get a very good look in a lot of the ankle. Okay, perfect. Uh, there is a question which is there for uh, you, Kaushal. Uh, Dr. Dadar is asking, do we need to reattach posterior talofibular ligament after excision of os trigonum? This is no, what no. Varmetum has asked you. Okay. No, you don't need. So basically, you, need. Uh, you have ankle, right? Your ankle has three, three basic uh, tough yeah. ligaments, the ATFL, the CFL, and the... Uh, uh, Posterior talofibular. So if you're dis disinserting one of the ligaments to take out the perfect, it's still stable, so you don't need to. Stable, so you don't need Thank you very much. Wonderful. So we go to uh, Satish now. I think it's a very very important topic which Satish is going to talk, and I think it's Arthur Bronstrom. I think uh, unstable ankles are something which are common. We tend to miss them, but uh, there are arthroscopic techniques to do it. Uh, but uh, what are the indications of this procedure and how exactly he does it, Satish Sonar? Uh, all yours. So can you? Yeah, we can. Can you just start your presentation? Can you visit, uh, see my? Yeah, screen? we can see your uh, screen of your computer. Yeah, yeah. We go to full screen. Yeah. Yeah. One minute. One. Yeah. No worries. No worries. No worries. No worries. I'm not able to. Uh. Till Satish is putting up, it's just a question which has come up. Uh, posterior ankle arthroscopy. How much do you do tibialis posterior tenolysis? Uh, uh, I mean, Kaushal, just a question to you before he puts it up. Posterior tibialis posterior tenolysis uh, arthroscopically. I don't think there's much indication for that. Okay, perfect. So that's the answer. No. Not much of indication. No, not really. It's difficult and usually it doesn't help. Okay, it doesn't help as well. Okay. And uh, okay. IPS, one more point I want to add uh, when you do a posterior ankle arthroscopy. Yeah. Very common to see the steroid process or astragonum in our scenario, especially over the 40 years in degenerative patients. Yeah. It doesn't mean that all the patients would go and do an arthroscopic excision of these patients because Perfect. conditions, even in early condition of subtalar arthritis, you will have a posterior uh, astragonum. Hey. Okay. You have to be very careful in choosing the correct indication for surgery. So, is it the MRI which shows an edema around it, which is uh, important, or is it the just clinical your... examination? Make sure okay. that the patient doesn't have any other pathology, like including subtalar arthritis. So, is so there a provocative a... test to actually uh, pinpoint that it is osteoarthritis, which is dropping? Plantar away. flexion. If you do an extensive plantar flexion, if yeah. a, uh, you do a plantar forceful flexion, plantar flexion, the patient exaggerate the pain, then that would be an indication that he is having. Perfect. A forceful plantar flexion in neutral it's, position and is, the patient tells it is, it is better to remember the ballet position. Ballet position is the best. Uh -huh. test so you ask the patient to stand on the toes and if uh -huh. he... Yeah. Hyper extensor, yeah. Hyper so Satish, we can see your screen. Uh, Satish yes, is from Nagpur yes. and he is going to talk about arthro bonstrom. I think, uh, Satish. Thank yes, you. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, as we all know, the anterolateral uh, ligament instabilities are quite common and we very often see them in our uh, routine uh, OPDs and uh, we usually um, treat them uh, with the RISE therapy, but still about 20-30% uh, of the patients will have uh, a future instability and we need to do uh, something for them. So, as we all know, the ligaments on the lateral sides are uh, very important and there are so this you can go to the play mode. Play mode. You can, uh, you, can play play. Mode. you press play. Yes. 
nerves okay yeah so there are anterior tibio fibular ligament and a posterior tibio fibular ligament which is a part of syndosmotic ligament then there is a anterior talo fibular ligament uh, fibular ligament and uh, the peroneum retinaculum which also has an extensive role in the lateral uh, stability so what are the special tests the anterior test is a very specific test for the uh, tear of uh, anterior uh, talo fibular ligament and the uh, inversion test or uh, talar test tilt test uh, usually test both and if it is positive when there is a tear in both the anterior talo fibular as well as the uh, calcano fibular ligament and the, the remaining three tests are usually for the syndesmotic uh, ligament injuries and i won't cover that so the anterior drawer test which is the most uh, sensitive and specific test for the anterior talo fibular ligament you have to hold the distal tibia with one hand and uh, the ankle will be either in neutral or the plantar flexion position and just give a anterior drawer just like uh, uh, we just like we do it in a uh, acl uh, tear and uh, you will see a fleshy end point as well as dimple here you can see this is my own patient where you can clearly visualize the dimple uh, Uh, anterior laterally, and this suction sign is uh, the positive indication that uh, there is a tear in the anterior talofibular ligament. So the inversion uh, test, the, the inversion test is uh, uh, you have to hold the uh, distal tibia with one hand and uh, on the with the foot in the plantar flexion give a uh, inversion uh, stress. And uh, if the patient is having the pain, that means uh, there is a tear in the calcanofibular ligament. in addition to the anterior talo fibular ligament and part of that test is a talar tilt test which uh, in same position we can do a stress x ray also uh, comparing to the uh, other uh, angle so i won't go in detail about this test because these are for the uh, syndesmotic injuries it's same so the imaging x ray x ray you have to rule out uh, the syndesmotic injuries in addition to the uh, stress test uh, for the uh, lateral opening and if it is and in mri mri is more specific for the syndesmotic as well as uh, the anterolateral ligament tear here you can clearly see the tear in the syndesmotic uh, ligament especially the anterior tibio fibular ligament and this is the patient which i operated you can clearly see the thinned out and stretched out uh, anterior talo fibular ligament there is a big uh, osteophyte anteriorly impinging on the talus with a defect in the uh, talar neck so this is the open technique reconstruction i won't go into so i usually do it in a hanging position without any traction uh, i initially mark the portal the anterolateral portal is uh, just uh, uh, lateral to the uh, just medial to the peroneus tertius and uh, the anteromedial portal is uh, just uh, medial to the tibialis anterior uh, tendon and the foot is hanging by the side of the uh, table and then i mark the superficial peroneal nerve the uh, extensor retinaculum and the uh, peroneus tendon and this uh, instrument is most important that is a uh, micro suture lasso for the uh, repair of uh, the anterior talo fibular ligament arthroscopically so this is visualizing through the anterior medial portal cleaning the synovium uh, from the gutter and the anterior compartment here you can see the defect uh, in the uh, the condal defect in the talar neck because of the anterior impingement and in such chronic cases there is a lot of uh, synovitis in the anterior as well or compartment as well as the anterolateral uh, gutter
you can see the clear cut implement on dorsiflexion so this is the thinned out uh, uh, anterior talofibular ligament you can clearly visualize it <clears throat> then i use a 5 mm osteotome to take out this uh, osteophyte from the, uh, the from the tibial plafond you can clearly visualize this big osteophyte which is impinging on the talar neck i pass the osteotome from the anterolateral portal and by gently remove it you can see this big osteophyte removed from the distal plafond this is the peroneus longus tendon then i smooth the uh, smoothen out this area with the help of a shaver i don't use burr because burr will uh, uh, cause more damage and remove too much of the bone which i don't want so this is the ligament then i pass uh, clear this uh, distal fibula pass the inserter for inserting the anchor first i insert the proximal uh, anchor previously i used to use a metal anchor but nowadays i use uh, uh, the suture fix anchor then uh, from inside out i use this uh, micro suture lasso passing through the uh, torn ligament torn and uh, lax ligament and then through the extensor retinaculum and then pass the nitinol wire the two sutures are passed inside out and then this is the second bite then the second anchor is passed about 1 cm distal to the first one near the tip of the uh, fibula and the lateral malleolus the same now the second uh, far bite i took from outside in technique and this is after tying you can see the completely taut uh, ligament you can see it's very taut there is a bleeding so you cannot visualize clearly but you can see there is a taut anterior talofibular ligament this is the ligament very tight with the probe and you have to tight it in a full uh, dorsiflexion and uh, some uh, eversion so this is a small scar and these are the two anchor previously i used to use the metal anchor so you can see the anchors here one proximally and one next to the other tip of the fibula so post operatively i keep them either in a slab for two weeks or or uh, if the patient is affording then i can use this type of the uh, brace uh, they have to do icing 15 minutes a day for uh, about uh, two to three times a day for about a week after two weeks i start gentle uh, uh, a range of uh, movement but no plantar friction and uh, inversion then from third to eighth week i start with a elo theraband exercises and progressing it to the uh, green and blue uh, theraband uh, exercises and two weeks two months onward then full range of movement no brace nothing and Uh, rigorous uh, strengthening exercises but still i ask patient not to do squatting and square leg sitting for about 3 uh, months and after 3 uh, months from the 4th to 8th month then patient will start one leg balancing zigzag running and all these type of sport specific activities and endurance uh, 
training. This is the patient, you can see the full range of motion and very small uh, scar. The inversion test and Taylor test, test is uh, negative. I can see a very thin scar, which is also not much visible. Visible. They can do a full squatting. That uh, anterior drawer test is negative. And after one year from the surgery, I did his MRI. You can see the completely healed uh, anterior talofibular ligament. This uh, osteophyte is completely removed and it is smooth. And that talar defect is also healed over the period of the time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Satish. Uh, indeed, it was a wonderful demonstration of how you can arthroscopically manage such difficult injuries. A uh, lot of questions coming after people have seen your video. And uh, one question which is important is, how much chronic uh, a ligament tear can you do an arthroscopic uh, repair? So it depends uh, upon the uh, quality of the tissue on the MRI. As, as much as uh, as long as three years or four years old injuries also can be managed uh, uh, arthroscopically. Uh, only thing is the tissue should be good. If the tissue is not uh, good on the MRI, it's very thin, flimsy, or even while doing the arthroscopy, you find out that the tissue quality is not good, then you can use a perineus brevis tendon and do a reconstruction. Yeah, yeah. we'll talk about reconstruction. Uh, can you just uh, uh, remove your slide share so we can have one entire faculty coming in? Oh, yeah, oh. you just, uh, yeah, slide share, just, uh, yeah, oh. perfect. Uh, uh, any difference of opinion, Mark, would you do a chronic tear as well, arthroscopic bone storm? Uh, my opinion, uh, I, I don't really do that procedure. It's still okay. pretty experimental in Australia, but okay. I think it's a wonderful procedure and I would like to, uh, to see the data and uh, I know that it's, um, it's gaining impact. Uh, Sundar, uh, your experience about arthroscopic bone strain? So my cases, all cases are whatever I done so far, all chronic. I done one. I'm the, I done only open procedure. Oh, so open procedures. No, okay. Uh, Tam, can you add on something? Uh, what's your experience regarding arthroscopic procedure? Yes, last Kolkata conference we have seen ten operating on arthroscopy. Ten, ah, so ten. How old is the injury you usually operate? A chronic also you operate? Uh, most of them, I think, would be uh, chronic. Yeah, okay. uh, there's still con some controversy whether we should repair them early. So most of the time, I think we agree that we should repair them when it's uh, chronic laxity. So there is a question, Tam, I mean, and, and it's all open to all the faculty. Uh, how do you evaluate that quality of tissue? And would you do internal bracing in some of your patients if you feel tissue quality is not good? So maybe we can start with Tam. He's got extensive experience regarding this. Um, yeah, so I think if you feel that the quality of the tissue is uh, not good or there are other things that put the patient at higher risk like a generalized ligament, uh, ligamentous laxity, then uh, we should think about augmentation. Uh, but there are different options for augmentation like you could do a non-anatomic repair with the peroneus uh, brevis tendon. Uh, you could bring in a lot of the extensor retinoculum to compensate for the uh, lack of good tissue. And certainly, okay, I think if the internal of grade is talk, available, anyways, uh, Tam, you're going to cover those points in the next talk. Uh, yeah, I think I'll mention oh, a little wonderful, bit. Of it. Wonderful. Uh, Sundar, the question is, uh, how do you regain proprioception in such patients? These patients have very poor proprioception and they have a tendency to fall down again and twist their ankles. And you showed a couple of lax and you have an experience of lax patients as well. No, I don't have. Because my experience in the instability surgeries are very few. Very few. Uh, very few Mark, and, uh, Question yeah. was how to regain proprioception post ligament reconstruction in such cases. Uh, I think um, they will always have some weakness of proprioception. I don't think we're ever going to be able to resolve that because it's a nerve injury. But um, I think uh, it really comes down to physiotherapy and also uh, a, a bracing if they're going to return to sport, some form of even just a sleeve is very useful just to provide some uh, assistance. Um, and there have been some good studies, particularly in sports in Australia, where, where uh, bracing is not needed for patients who've never had an ankle injury. Mm -hmm. But everyone who's had an ankle injury seems to uh, have problems with proprioception. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Uh, there is a question which says, uh, uh, if the tear is towards the Taylor side, uh, how is the procedure? I mean, does it happen uh, that anterior talofibular ligament or it is always torn towards the fibular side? 
so it's a question which has come <laughs> uh, it are, yeah most of the time it's a mid substance uh, tear it's rarely yeah. happens on the taller or the fibular side okay okay and uh, there is another question from dr ajay arthroscopic versus open repair so if uh, satish you have experience of both and you said yeah you do open as well so which is better for chronic ankle instability that's the question it's a broad uh, question but you can answer it maybe both are both are better open is also a very good uh, procedure and it can be done in a very small 4 to 5 cm uh, incision you can clearly visualize the lax uh, ligament cut it uh, near the fibula then pass the anchor in the fibula repair uh, means a double breast it and then uh, put a extensor retinaculum as a uh, cover or it uh, just like an augmentation so open is also a very good uh, procedure okay perfect most uh, of the time it's uh, easier than orthoscopy one Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sundar wants to add something. And also, I advise because the open procedure gives more confidence. You are doing a double thrusting of the repair. Yes. You are yes. reinforcing with your extensor retinaculum, so that result-wise, in my opinion, whatever cases I had done, the, all the patients are doing very well. So that's why I didn't go for arthroscopy. Still, because still in the yes, Mark, Mark said that is still in uh, maybe yeah, we have to wait for some more time. perfect sundar do you protect your uh, uh, double breasting and uh, augmentation with some kind of internal brace with fiber tape does it help no, or I, do i don't do it i don't never do it. do it okay perfect i think let's go to kem uh, ken uh, jam tan and i think he has extensive experience regarding uh, ligament reconstruction and we were talking to him about uh, other augmentation procedures as well so uh, i think his talk will be interesting uh, Uh, are you able to see my uh, yeah we are able to see yes, yes, doctor yes, yes okay that's great i'll start so i'll just be speaking um a little bit about uh optimizing outcomes in ankle ligament repair as you know i'm quite passionate about ankle ligament repair and i am a proponent of the arthrobrostrum that we uh, saw a, saw a presentation just now nice presentation so i'll just speak a little bit about how i think we can make that even uh, better So as we know the brostrum or open brostrum repair is uh, considered by many as a gold standard for ankle ligament repair uh, but there is some data to show that not all brostrums actually uh, will always end up with a good result uh, some patients may uh, stretch out uh, or be prone to re-injury and a small group of patients of mine also they get a certain amount of arthrofibrosis and they actually end up a bit stiff so either spectrum they may stretch out a bit or they may end up a little bit too stiff so the question is can the brostrum be better um because some of these repairs may stretch out or be prone to re-injury uh certainly most of us or all of us uh, will find that initial protection of the repair is uh, necessary this may be in a back slab a cast a fracture boot etc but basically we would agree that protection of the repair is necessary However this protection of the repair leads a, uh, to a delay in mobilization of the patient and or they are returned to weight bearing and to sport. Uh, furthermore the uh, open rostrum is still mainly an open surgery. There's a uh, reasonably good data to show that um unprotected motion uh, straight after an uh, ATFL repair is associated with significant lengthening of the ligament. which means we basically have to go slow on the rehabilitation after a brostrum. Um so if you look at this graph uh, it's a biomechanical study and you look at the native uh, ATFL and if you look at a brostrum even with anchors that's only about half or less uh, in terms of uh, failure strength compared to the native ATFL. Uh however if you augment the brostrum uh, which you have used some anchors with and you put a fiber tape and internal brace the uh pull out strength of failure strength of the construct at immediately at the point of surgery is already a lot stronger than a native ATFL so hence there's quite a bit of excitement around using a augmentation with a uh, fiber tape uh usefulness of an internal brace um as you can see here that's what an internal brace is it's a fiber tape which runs across the uh brostrum repair it gives immediate uh, stability uh, it prevents elongation during rehabilitation so hence allowing for less protection faster rehabilitation and uh, earlier return to sport 
uh, I think it also gives a more natural form of biomechanics to the joint because you don't use the extensor retinoculum, uh, which is a non-anatomic uh, structure to reinforce the repair. And there's good data to show that uh, the mean time to full weight bearing as well as the mean time to return to sport is actually quite a bit faster when you have augmented your repair with a uh, brace. So one of the problems here is uh, an internal brace augmentation is still quite an invasive procedure. So here you see a picture from a textbook of a typical brostrum uh, repair and the incision is quite extensive there. For most people who are quite familiar with uh, doing a brostrum that they would be able to reduce their size of the incision maybe to half of that. But when you're doing an internal brace, uh, generally, you need quite a uh, good exposure because you want to be confident when you're putting your anchors into the uh, lateral malleolus and you also need to identify a good place to put your anchor in the talus. So you need a reasonably uh, invasive or open uh, exposure to do that. So really, the recent advances, I feel, uh, conflict each other to some extent. Like we said, the internal brace is good. It, 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 uh, the, the repair is like, less likely to stretch out. It gives stability, better biomechanics, faster rehab. But on the other hand, as you know, I, I am quite a fan of the arthroscopic uh, reconstruction as well. So de being able to decrease the invasiveness of the repair is good, but that somehow is um, fighting with the, uh, the other uh, advancement, which is the internal brace. Uh, this uh, is my own picture of how I do the arthroscopic brostrum, uh, which is not very different from what uh, Satish showed earlier. So as you can see, uh, one or two anchors are put into the uh, lateral malleolus and the sutures are passed outside in or inside out, uh, reefing the ATFL as well as the uh, inferior extensor retinoculum. Uh, so some of the possible advantages of uh, doing the arthrobrostrum, if they weren't already mentioned before, you can do therapy or concurrent intra-articular pathology such as uh, any anterolateral impingement, you can address any osteochondral lesions, possibly faster rehabilitation, uh, and less post-operative pain, better cosmesis. Uh, this is my own personal series of my own patients where we had patients with an open rostrum and an arthrobrostrum. Uh, we found that the results of the arthrobrostrum were equal to, at least equal to the open rostrum. Um, so the outcomes were at least similar, but the, the arthroscopic technique, once you're used to it, was associated with a slightly faster surgical time and possibly faster rehabilitation. So how can we marry the two advantages uh, or two advances, one being an arthroscopic uh, repair, the other one being uh, some sort of uh, suture tape augmentation. Uh, so I'll show you a little bit about what I think is a good way that I've been uh, repairing these ligaments maybe for the past six to nine months. Uh, so what we did was we based the uh, repair slightly differently from the arthrobrostrum. We based it on a uh, technique described uh, by Dr. Vega. Uh, that's an arthroscopic all inside repair of the ATFL, but we, we modified that uh, to some extent to allow uh, uh, suture tape augmentation. So we, instead of using uh, sutures, we use a suture tape and two of these suture tapes function as the uh, internal brace. So that will allow you to do the repair arthroscopically, but also uh, add an augmentation. So surgical technique, uh, not hugely different. Uh, there's a, uh, in terms of portals, there's a medial viewing portal, a lateral uh, working portal, usual portals that you use for ankle uh, arthroscopy. But there's a far lateral portal, as you see in the picture there. It's just over the, the anterior edge of the lateral malleolus. Uh, uh, a radio frequency one would be useful uh, if you have it. An optional, which I use also, would be a um, suture passport for suture management. And you need a small uh, micro suture lasso. So when we enter the joint from the medial uh, portal, uh, that's a typical view that we get. So the first thing you need to do is to clear the, uh, uh, any scar tissue or synovitis in the uh, lateral gutter. And then for this way of doing it, you need to then advance your scope all the way across to the lateral side and peer deep down into the uh, lateral gutter. And uh, once you're there, then you can establish your, your lateral portal as you see here. Uh, this is a far lateral portal and the view is from the medial portal. And over here, you see the suture passport, which is in a lateral portal. So that's all the three portals. 
And the tissues you want to repair are these tissues running from the fibula to the talus. This is the lateral wall of the talus. So these tissues are the lateral capsular tissues and the ATFL. So these tissues are the lateral capsular tissues and the ATFL. So it's actually a bit lower down than you think. Yeah? So you need to really get into the lateral gutter to get there. So once you've identified the ATFL uh, remnant, then you want to pass your suture lasso from the lateral portal. And this uh, picture here you see is the tip of the suture lasso. This suture lasso has come in from the lateral portal. It's dug underneath the ATFL and the lateral capsule. And then it's come out uh, right in front of the lateral uh, malleolus. Uh, then the suture lasso is uh, pushed out from the, from the suture passer and is pulled out into the lateral, far lateral portal. Then from this suture lasso, you put in two, two, two tails of a suture tape and the two tails are pulled across and underneath the ATFL as you see in the picture up there. Then once it's pulled across, you put in a suture retriever from the lateral portal and retrieve the other two from the far lateral portal. Once you, once you have that, then you have, four, you have four of these suture tapes coming out from the uh, lateral portal and you loop them together to form a cinch around the, the, the ATFL. So here you see a cinch being formed around the ATFL. So once you've got that cinch, then you, you can use a knotless anchor and uh, really get down low to where, to near the footprint of the ATFL, really low near the tip of the malleolus, and you pull this, the, the ATFL tight and anchor it into the lateral malleolus. So I think people who do shoulder surgery would be familiar with this because it's similar to what shoulder surgeons would do like for the labrum. Yeah, so here I put a probe and I'm probing this to make sure that this is really tightened and pulled up to the, to the lateral malleolus. And this is the repair ATFL. And now you've got these two suture tapes coming out from the lateral portal, and that's what we're going to use as our internal brace. So those two suture tapes, we put a suture retriever in from the far lateral portal, and we pull the two suture tapes out from the far lateral portal. Then the suture retriever is pushed onto the capsule, the lateral capsule of the joint, and it's pushed across from the far lateral portal subcutaneously in the direction of the lateral portal and is repunctured into the joint as you see from here. So this, what this does is it puts the two, two suture tapes uh, running from the fibula across to the talus, but they're sit sitting extra capsular and they're not in the joint, which, the way, which is the correct way which an internal brace should be. It actually should be extra capsular. Then we actually put the suture retriever in from the lateral portal here and pull the two suture tapes out through the lateral portal. So here you see the completed uh, picture, which is basically the repair ATFL here is pulled up to the lateral malleolus. Then the two suture tapes exit the joint from there. They grow out extra capsular and then repuncture the joint here and exit out through the, through the lateral portal. Once you've done that, then you, you just need to put another anchor down on the talus, on the lateral wall of the talus, low down near where the ATFL inserts onto the talus. You aim it upwards so that you don't put the anchor into the subtalar joint. And then the, the two suture tapes as the internal brace are anchored down into that uh, anchor onto the lateral wall of the talus. And here you see when you tighten everything, it pushes the whole capsule down onto the, onto the talus. And then you, you just cut off the sutures there at the end. So what this achieves is a very anatomical repair of the ATFL. It's a knotless repair. Uh, you don't have to involve the uh, inferior extensor retinoculum. So the subtalar motion is not impeded as much. Uh, the patients on the table are immediately quite stable, but not stiff. So here you see after the repair, there's still a fairly good range of motion, fairly good plantar flexion, fairly good inversion, but a good stop at the end a good stop from the internal brace and the repair at the end. So these patients are quite um, aggressive with their rehabilitation. So I allow them to ambulate uh, full weight bearing as tolerated in a brace. Uh, so I put uh, this, this uh, brace on immediately after the repair in the operating room and they are allowed to weight bear on this brace immediately. They use the brace for three weeks and the sutures are removed around three weeks and the brace is also removed at three weeks and they are allowed active uh, rehabilitation straight after at three weeks. So they are allowed to um, 
do proprioceptive exercise, uh, some strengthening exercises and range of motion exercises once the brace is off at three weeks. So a typical patient is like this patient who is just about four weeks post-op. So his brace would have come off about one week ago. And so they have fairly good motion. You don't you, you, you find it very hard to get this with a brostrum or arthro brostrum because they tend to be quite tight at this point. And they can actually walk comfortably uh, and can do proprioceptive exercises and uh, calf strengthening exercises uh, quite comfortably. Uh, this procedure I find quite useful also if you have to do a concurrent osteochondral lesion because uh, you can put them in the brace immediately, but then maybe twice a day, ask them to take out the brace and do range of motion exercises immediately after the surgery. So that'll be good for your cartilage repair. So in summary, um, a brostrum is a good procedure, but not all brostrums uh, may do well. There's also some limitations in the rehabilitation and return to sport. Uh, brostrums also tend to still be done generally uh, with open surgery. And I think uh, one way to advance ligament repair is not only to do it arthroscopically, uh, but also to do an arthroscopic repair with an internal uh, brace augmentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tam. Uh, uh, it was a wonderful presentation. And uh, the technique, how you actually marry both uh, Bonstrom and an internal brace was wonderful. Now, there are a couple of questions which are coming in. And first question is, uh, uh, like Satish said, he would actually put the ankle in... Uh, uh, dorsiflexion and slightly inversion, inversion and then fix it, uh, the, uh, the ATFL. Uh, but uh, what is the position of foot would you do uh, fixation on the fibular side? And then when you fix on the tailor side, would you change the position of foot? Uh, yes, actually, so there's two positions. For the uh, fibular side, when we're just repairing the ATFL, yeah. I want to get the ATFL as tight as possible. So I, yeah. do, I would um, do that in dorsiflexion. Yeah. But when we are anchoring the internal brace into the talus, uh, yeah. we don't want to do that in dorsiflexion and inversion because it will make it too tight. Yeah. So actually, you know, usually we will use our stomach to push against the, the foot to keep the ankle in dorsiflexion. But when I'm putting in and tightening the talus ankle, I release the, the, my tummy from the foot and allow the foot to plantar flex naturally. And okay. then I put in the talus ankle in plantar flexion. So the, the internal brace basically functions as the end point for the for the for the joint. Perfect. I think that's a point well taken. Uh, if you can uh, unshare your uh, share screen so we can have a look at all the faculty and then also talk one to one. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is a question, uh, Satish. It is actually to you. He says the first time ankle instability. Would you still operate or you uh, do an arthroscopic monstrum or you uh, rehabilitate? No. 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 no, no. I will uh, do that same rice therapy. Uh, okay. Simple uh, so when, when, is your indication, when is your indication then for a uh, procedure? How how many times instability would have happened? Or uh, no, I will put them uh, on this therapy followed by physiotherapy for about five, three to six months. And even after six months, if he is feeling unstable on uh, uh, anyone's surfaces or uh, uh, walking, uh, uh, climbing up and down the stair, then I will do MRI, look out uh, uh, whether the uh, ligament is still lax and I will do all the clinical tests and if I found there is a squeezing sign or limping, then I will advise him the uh, repair. Doctor, is there a different protocol for a multi-directional, uh, uh, I mean, uh, lax people? Uh, there might be people who might be physiologically lax as well. So is there a protocol which is different in those patients uh, to choose uh, the patient? Like generalized ligamentous laxity? Generous ligament laxity along with a ligament tear. So, uh, would, would you be afraid of operating them uh, or would you uh, operate them early? Uh, well, I think a lot of these people, they, are, they tend to be young uh, female patients. They are yeah. generalized, uh, you know, they have loose ligaments all over. And a lot of them uh, have, have loose ankles on both sides. Uh, and most of the time we see them and they've had one bad injury and they actually totally stretch out or tear one side and they decompensate a lot uh, once that happens. So for these patients, actually, I would, uh, once is they have decompensated, uh, it's really hard to rehabilitate them back to normal because they're really, they started off really with generalized laxity. So I actually have a lower threshold to, to recommend them surgery. Okay, perfect. Uh, is there an, any MRI indicator? The question says that a lot of people come with an MRI which says grade 2 tier of uh, anterior talofibular ligament. 
they feel uh, instability which is not an overt instability but a subtle instability would you still do an arthroscopy or would you just put them on a rehab so dr tan maybe you can answer that right i think if it's a uh, chronic uh, at least like is it about 3 to 6 months and they're still symptomatic uh, to me symptomatic could mean persistent pain uh, okay. aches after doing activity it doesn't always mean that they must have outright persistent um, uh, repeated injuries you know they could feel very insecure when they walk on the ankle especially if the ground is uneven uh so i go quite clinical if they are quite symptomatic uh that way uh i don't place over emphasis on the mri so if they are okay. quite symptomatic and i clinically feel that the ankle is uh has uh, instability uh, i think they will benefit from a repair so dr satish showed us two tests he was showing us a draw test and also the uh, dimple sign or is there any other clinical test would you do uh, to diagnose and uh... Ah okay so I think for me the other than just listening to the patients and um figuring out their symptoms I I still use the anterior drawer test a lot I I don't have any other special um tricks That's for right. testing that uh, there is a question from Dr Nicholas Antao he says what is the spectrum of Taylor lesions you see in acute and chronic uh, ankle sprains like this so you said osteochondral lesion any other thing which you want to add uh, Taylor lesions or Oh the most common would be just uh, a lot of marrow edema. That okay. means if you um look at a lot of these patients with ankle laxity they, they uh, some of them or a large percentage of them actually have uh, marrow edema in the talus not always uh, just a osteochondral lesion. So most common would be marrow edema but we can't really do anything surgical about that. Uh thank you very much. I think uh, we have um, uh can I ask Dr. Please? Mark uh Till the till Mark is putting presentation, I think we can have two three more questions, which are actually to Sundar you also and uh, Satish you also. So Mark, till the time you put presentation, Sundar the question. Yeah. Uh, no, this is to uh, to Dr. Koshal. Koshal, uh, Dr. Nic- Nicholas again asks you, uh, flexor hallucis longus tenosynovitis. I mean, how you differentiate between an ostrigonum and FHL tenosynovitis? and uh, do do you arthroscopically manage fhl uh, synovitis yeah so a, a very interesting question and uh, thank you uh, i think with a lot of lot of the times uh, it is difficult to differentiate between uh, pain due to fhl uh, synovitis and ostrigonum okay. but you can you can actually clinically feel it so if you put your hand behind your medial malleolus and press deep and okay. move your big to up and down you could actually feel the movement of the fhl uh, beneath your fingers Okay. At that point of time, if the patient says, "I have pain," then you have clinically located the pain as a facial tenosynovitis. Whereas in a uh, impingement, it's actually a bony stop. I mean, it's pain at the terminal end of the movement. So if you have, if you position the patient in the ballet position or you do a hyper plantar flexion, then at the end of the movement you have pain. But oh, perfect. Patient procedure of pain throughout the entire range of motion. You know, you can actually clinically differentiate that. Perfect. a uh, uh, question to sundar uh, you were talking about anterior impingement i think we are going to also talk uh, about anterior impingement with mark but this question is would you also clear gutters when you do and uh, clearing the soft tissue impingement which you you also go to the gutters and clear that uh, the, it depends upon the diagnosis okay so more often you require in this case of a synovitis yeah. and when you have arthrofibrosis you have to go all around the joint like what you do in the knee joint Okay. But if you have a typical anterolateral impingement or anteromedial impingement, we can address that particular point. is more than sufficient because you will not have any lesions in the gutter. So, only the two conditions: synovial hypertrophy and arthrofibrosis. So, you have to go all around the joint and clear, including the uh, clearing the both gutters. Uh, okay, wonderful. A question to Satish. I mean, before we go to uh, Mark, and, uh, and we still have many questions, but we'll ask later. This is a question that what is the role of CFL injury in ankle instability? Do we need to address a CFL injury? Yes, if uh, if it is there on the MRI, then you can uh, address it. You have to add a uh, one more anchor uh, uh, posterior laterally, and uh, then uh, you can incorporate that part of the ligament in the repair also. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Is, during the diagnosis of uh, like ankle instability, yeah, uh, it doesn't mean the MRI is the diagnostic factor for any surgery. So I think most often it's a clinical, the whether the recurrent instability or how the patient describes, and it should correlate with the antiarthritis. Again, the antiarthritis is not positive in all the cases. Sometimes patients be very protective, unless they are associated with the CFL. 
I don't. Uh, I will not be able to demonstrate anti dryer in all the cases if the uh, unless the patient has got a lax joint. So it's more okay. often it's a clinical diagnosis, and also many patients will have just impingement, anterolateral impingement. So in that patients sometimes you no need to do a, even instability surgery. You do a debridement, they will do very well. Perfect. I think uh, we have many questions, but we'll come later as well. Uh, thank you, Mark, for joining in. So Mark is going to talk about ankle impingement. Uh, all yours, Mark. Uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, I have some videos and I hope that they work. So I'm just going to try this and uh, uh, welcome to everybody um, from Melbourne. And uh, I'm going to cover a lot of uh, the other Dr. Sundarajan's talk as well. So it might be a good reminder for everyone. But really with anterior ankle impingement, we have uh, usually bone impingement anteriorly, which can be anterior. Antromedial, which I see quite commonly in sports people. Antrolateral, which tends to be post-traumatic. And posterior impingement, which we've talked about with osteogonum. So we also have soft tissue impingement as well. But uh, investigations tend to be related to x-ray, which many times it's uh, obvious with bone impingement. Then on the MRI on the right, you can see uh, a similar scan to what we saw before, which is a very thickened synovium and uh, soft tissue impingement. I don't tend to use CT scan so much as it tends to be, uh, it tends to be better to do an MRI because you can cover a lot more bases with differential diagnosis, look for osteochondral lesions and other problems, talonavicular joint. Uh, it's important to consider differential diagnosis with, uh, with these injuries. Um, and the most common that we see are really occasionally stress fracture, uh, tibial Taylor stress fracture, osteochondral lesions like the one above are, uh, are very common and something to think about. The pain tends to be deeper pain and tends to be not so uh, movement specific. And then you have uh, conditions such as the MRI that you see here, which has features of, of anterior impingement, but also there's a lot of arthritis here. And this is not the case that you want to do arthroscopic debridement on because the patient will not be happy. They will still have pain. And then there are other causes of anterior ankle pain, which can be instability. So the symptoms, as you know, are activity related. So they don't get pain at rest. And it's usually a sports person, usually with some sort of running. And it's often when they kick or land and they describe stiffness and they will tell you that going up hills or upstairs causes pain. So I'm gonna move on to perhaps focus a bit more on the surgical side. So this is my setup for arthroscopy, uh, very similar to the other ones that you've seen. Uh, I like the foot just on the end of the bed. I don't generally use traction. I have a little um, uh, pouch, which uh, helps to catch some of the fluid. And I just use gravity feed uh, uh, saline. Just another view with the, uh, as a surgeon, you're standing at the end of the bed, you're looking up towards the head and the screen is uh, in the center of the table. So uh, as far as tools, I have uh, usually use a 2.9 millimeter arthroscope, although it does come in a four millimeter cannula. So it's a standard size uh, and that is, is adequate for most things, but sometimes if you feel safer with a smaller arthroscope, it's a very good decision. And usually a four millimeter shaver is sufficient in the ankle. You don't want to go too much bigger, like in a knee. Uh, I have this particular osteotome, which I find very useful. Uh, it's a longer osteotome with a broad handle. So if uh, your assistant is hammering, your fingers are a lot less at risk. It has a four millimeter uh, beveled uh, and angled tip, which is very good if you're trying to uh, get out uh, 
bone from different positions around the ankle. And uh, it's, it's quite a useful device. Then uh, you have a four millimeter uh, round or oval uh, burr, which we use occasionally. I also like to use uh, a, uh, an arthro wand, uh, which uh, for soft tissue debridement is very good as we saw before. So uh, in here we have uh, insertion of the first uh, portal, which is tall before medial portal is uh, entered first. Uh, you can uh, inject saline or not, depending on how comfortable you feel. And this will uh, assist you with uh, locating your, um, your lateral portal. Usually I will put the arthroscope in here, which allows you to visualize the lateral side quite well. You can visualize the nerves, any vessels, and then I'll make a lateral portal after that. Now, I'm hopeful that this works. Uh, unfortunately, I have some really good uh, video, which I can't get to work. But uh, so that's no good. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, can you open your file and show? Can I open? Yeah, I think you can uh, maybe minimize the presentation and go to your file folder and just. Show uh, it just. There. Can I just go here? Yeah. Yeah. Go to the file folder. Yeah. Can you see that now? No, still no. It's still the other one. Uh, you're not seeing any video. No, we. You need to. You have to stop sharing. Stop sharing, then stop go back. Stop share and then open and then. Okay. All right. I'll stop sharing. Then go back to the main computer screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can open your uh, video there and then share again. Oh, once I. All right. Yeah. Hold on. So I have to share again now. Yeah. 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 Once you start your video, then you start sharing. Then only do it. Yeah. Okay, it's not going to be. No, it won't let me do it, unfortunately. No, take your own time. No worries. Uh, till the no. time, we can just pop in a couple of questions to panel. Yeah. See, you're putting it up. Uh, Nicholas wants to ask all the panel is there a role of stress x rays? So, maybe uh, anybody who is volunteering, stress x rays of an ankle for instability. I think Tan is the best person. Tan, Tan. yeah, if you can just let us know. Um, well, you, you can do it, but I basically, uh, I, I don't find it very useful for, okay. for me. Okay. Uh, it's troublesome logistically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, second question is, uh, how would you operate patients with uh, pain without instability? Would you do an ankle arthroscopy still? There is no overt instability, just pain, and you are unable to find a reason of pain. So is there a role of diagnostic arthroscopy and... Uh, for me, no, I do not do a diagnostic ankle arthroscopy. I think you really need to Pinpoint. come up with a diagnosis before you yeah, scope the ankle. Sometimes a patient with a chronic instability, the patient won't have a symptom of instability, but they have pain mainly because of the impingement in the gutter or sometimes because of the anterior osteophyte uh, impinging on the talar neck. Mm -hmm. So with the arthroscopy, if you can just clear the gutter, uh, remove that small osteoid and patient will be far better. Yeah, yes. but you need to be I, sure I, that I, there is something which will help the patient. I completely agree with Satish that this is not, this is the even a diagnosis clinically and MRI wise. Yeah. Generally, yeah. you have to diagnose before and otherwise patients are not going to be happy. Uh, yes, Satish said if a patient had a recurrent instability before and no instability for quite long time, but if the patient has got persistent pain in the dorsiflexion, Sometimes they can have anterolateral impingement. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. cannot be demonstrated by MRI. Yeah. So in, in that kind of chronic case, if they don't improve with the conservative management, still you can go on arthroscopy and debride. They do very well. Yes. Uh, yes. There are very few indications for that. Very few. Only the internal impingement yeah. is the only indication. Probably you can go ahead that way. Uh, though it's not a part of uh, our uh, program today, but uh, there is a question. There are a lot of tendons around ankle. So is there a role of tenoscopies, especially peroneal tenoscopy? Uh, uh, are anybody of you doing some tenoscopies in the patient? I think I ankle experts or maybe? Peroneal, isolated peroneal tenosynovitis, there is a role. Okay. Uh, but we have to be very careful that, uh, I mean, this patient doesn't have any associated 
uh, anterolateral instability. So when you deal with the peroneal pathology, it is very important to rule out anterolateral pathology or in intraarticular lesions. Then isolated peroneal tenoidal synovitis, it may help. Okay, yes, endoscopy, it is, there is a role is there. You have to go, if your diagnosis should be proper, you have to use the small scope. Sometimes there are some aberrant peroneus brevis, peroneus brevis tendon, avulsion, whatever is there. But when me and Kusal was programming this thing, Kusal, me and Kusal tried to take that endoscopy part because of that, because that will be again is a big topic. No, I know, I know. There was a question, so that is why I asked, because... Uh, Ankle does not always mean it is an ankle injury. It's always a tenoscopy also. Which yeah, is it's, uh, the valid indication for uh, for tenoscopy for the tip post, Achilles and peroneus. But the reason we didn't include it, I thought this was a, well, like from the perspective, uh -huh. it's a beginner's sort of a thing. So that's okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so Mark, are we? Uh, uh, so what we can do is maybe if uh, we can have a Samantha who can put up his presentation. Yeah, yeah. Can, uh, yeah, I'm trying, but I'm sense, not getting sense, much good. So I think uh, let's come to our ankle arthrodesis. And I think uh, uh, Samantha has an innovative technique of how exactly we design ankle arthrodesis. Mark, 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 if you can unshare your uh, screen and work on your presentation. Yeah, perfect. And Samantha, if you can just share your screen. Okay, just and let second. us know the tricks and tricks of uh, uh, ankle arthrodesis. Uh, Arthroscopically, yeah. Meanwhile, I'll just search the chat box for any question till you are putting it up. Can, can you see yeah, that yeah. screen? Yeah, we I can. Guess. We can. Yeah, we can. You now you start. Yeah, perfect. Hope my video runs. Otherwise, this stop has no go role at all. It would work. Don't worry. Okay, okay, wait, let's hope. Yeah. Is it having full screen, no? IPS? Yeah, full screen. Please, go on, please start. Okay. So, I think, I think probably we are going at the penalty of talk. If the Mark is going to find his videos, probably he will come again. So, I will be giving my experience with the arthroscopic ankle arthrosis. Probably, uh, if you have gone through these, some of the basic things, then only you can go with that. So somebody, some people are asking how to distract the ankle. Probably we, I think nobody in the panel, we are going to use the fixed distractor or the this sort of x fix sort of thing. We usually use this sort of distractor. Okay. But even with this sort of distractor, I completely agree with Sundar that even with the distractor itself, you can do your arthroscopy ankle. So before we go there, what are the basic indications of doing your ankle arthrosis? Irrevers uh, there is irreversible damage of the hyaline cartilage. If the pain is disabling, post-traumatic, sometimes you can go with the rheumatoid, the psoriatic patient, hemopelic, tuberculosis, because in our country, we uh, see a few patients of the tuberculosis ankle. Basically, the guy who is, uh, for the person I did my first ankle arthroscopy, arthrodesis, was a tubercular female lady. And also for the charcoal one. The basic steps are like you have to debride the whole hyaline cartilage because if you want to do any arthros, this is any joint, you have to have clear the all the hyaline cartilage and you have to do the, expose the subchondral bone. Fusion reduction, you have to know the, what is the position for the fusion reduction. Usually for this ankle, it is like your neutral flexion and you have to see before and what is the extra rotation position of the other foot. If it mostly it is like for five to 10 degree of that thing. And you have to see your beforehand that you are not missing anything in your, started, in your sub, in, in your subchondral, your sub, subtalar arthrosis, uh, subtalar, your pain is not that severe. And the internal fixes, usually I do with two cancellous screws, usually 6.5 mm screws. So equipment's already, Sundar has told you, we don't do the same instrument, same whatever you use for the knee, knee thing. I use the same scope here, 30 degree, 4 mm. High speed bar is needed. That whatever you use for the shoulder bar for the subacromial decompression, same bar I use and sever. And the ring curate, which is very good for that. And I use, already I told you, I use the 6.5 mm cannulated cancellous screws. And you have to have the radiolucent table and the image because when you put your screws in, you have to be dead sure that you are not going into the, you are going into the proper place and you are not going into the subtalar joint or you are not misfiring. So portals, usually with two portal, anterolateral, anteromedial. So debridement, as I told you, you have to debride the, both the talar side, tibial side, medial and lateral gutter. 
and the posterior aspect, some uh, some part of the malleolus, and fusion position as I told you. So fixation done by six point five mm screws. Running, no. So IPS, it is running. It's running, sir. It's running. Okay. So this this lady, this was my first ankle arthritis, which I did probably. I I I I always mark this this you thing. You can re reduce the music. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, I can I, I can reduce the volume. Yeah, you can reduce the volume from there because I am already in full screen. If I go, then it will problem. Okay. So I forgot to reduce the volume there. You can reduce from there. So somebody was asking how to go with the ankle thing. It is always nick and spread. Like it is very small nick because you, if you don't want to injure your the injure your your small nerves around. So this is the anteromedial entry portal. Then you see that when I go inside, when I go inside, you can see that a lot of cartilages are floating inside, floating inside. So this is absolutely destroyed joint. You see, it is completely been destroyed. Synovial resection is done with your normal saber. What I use during the knee scope saber, I am using just to take off the loose cartilage flex. So once I once I take off the loose cartilage flex, you see I am taking off the flex from there. So now you see now we using this using that bar. What I use for the subacromial decompression. So because you have to take out the whole cartilage, or you should not left with anything around. So this is a, this is the bar I am using like that. Don't go very deep because if you go 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 very deep, that is it's a problem. It will be bleeding. Then I'm using the grasper to take out the fragments from there, grasping the loose cartilage pieces from there. Okay. So canvas screw. I go I go from the medial side and also from the lateral side. I go from the medial and lateral. This is the canvas screw. I am going from there. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Can you reduce your volume by keypad itself? You don't need to go out of presentation. I think it is from the F5. Yeah. Yeah, from keypad itself, just reduce. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to try to reduce that. Okay. So this is the way you can see. I am going with the 6.5 cantilever screw, and also I am going from the medial lateral side. This is the lateral screw. The main thing thing is that when you go from the medial side, don't tighten the screw completely because if you tighten the screw completely, you will be never be able to see the screw is going in. So if the this is the way it is seen. So this is the post op. So this is this is the this is the way. This is the primary X ray. So now you see. Once I have done that, the thing is that when you go give your fast screw, try don't tighten it completely because if you tighten your fast screw very tightly, then you won't be able to the second screw going in. Okay, so this is the partially threaded cantilever screw. This is not the fully threaded one. So below knee slab is there for two weeks, and below knee cast is there for twelve weeks. I don't allow them to work for three months, and weight bearing is only allowed after twelve weeks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, very much. I think there are two, three questions which have come up, and uh, excellent demo. Uh, one question is: If you have a dome collapse secondary to avascular necrosis of the dome of talus, which is quite common seen in traumatic lesions, would you still go ahead and do the same procedure which you are doing, or you would do an open ankle arthrodesis with grafting? Your sound was crackling in between. Yeah. Can you? Uh, I'll repeat it. The question is that if the dome of talus is collapsed due to avascular necrosis, would you do a, a same procedure? Yeah, yes. In the post-traumatic scenario, probably you don't find a good talus that that way. But still, it is not that uh, collapsed. It is unless it is a big collapse. Still, I can go with the um, ankle uh, with the arthroscopic ankle arthrosis unless it is a really deformed talus. Uh, Your opinion on that? Uh, any any difference of opinion here, Sundar? Yeah, you want yeah, I agree, I agree. I agree. Only the only the deformity is very huge, like more than fifteen degrees of deformity in any plant. Then most often you'll be able to do one. The idea of doing ankle arthrosis is just to because you are trying to keep the contact as much as possible without impairing the uh, injuring the soft tissues. So the advantage of uh, that biology is there when you do an arthroscopy. So if you are able to get the contact of ninety uh, percent of contact of both talus and tibia. 
I think it would be ideal. Still, you can do an arthroscopy. Kaushal, avascular uh, Taylor dome. Uh, would you still? Yeah. Arth so, arthroscopy. Very, very, very good, very good question. Uh, IPS. So, if it's a avascular Taylor dome collapse, ankle arthroplasty itself may not be the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. It depends upon what level it has collapsed. That is important. I mean, yeah. no, there is no body, there is no point in doing arthrodesis at all. The question was there whether there were only the teller dome is involved. Okay. Yeah. Not full tellers like this thing. The question was like, suppose you find that in a post-traumatic scenario, dome is some, collapse, they, some collapse at the dome. So I, have, I have a very bad experience in two cases where I did arthroscopic uh, uh, arthrodesis in such cases and I have to revise them. So when yeah. you have a tenor dome collapse, I now you take a right. graph from the iliac crest and I put an anterior uh, special plate uh, really? to fix it. Yeah, perfect. Mark, are you, uh, is it okay? Is the presentation I've got okay? a couple of, I'll try something. So give me a second. No worries, no worries. Uh, okay. The no, question is, uh, to Dr. Uh, uh, there is a question here uh, uh, to Dr. Jen. Uh, do you do sometime a soft tissue augmentation like a hamstring graft or a all, at all, uh, Allograph for your ankle instability. Oh, that would be uh, quite rare, I think, for okay. me to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any experience, Sundar? Any question for Tan? Yeah. Same repairs. What is your uh, IPS? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Can I ask a question to Tan? Yeah, Tan. Yeah, please. Because uh, we, because we don't, I don't operate any revision cases. What is your take for revision cases? What is your procedure of choice in uh, failure cases? For oh, failure cases, okay. I think in uh, for now, I think what I will do is I, I would uh, put in an internal brace if it wasn't put in the first time. So I would probably do an open surgery with a formal internal brace uh, before I would have used an allograft or a non-anatomic okay. procedure. Okay, I think uh, Mark is ready now. No, I don't think I can get the the, the video, video working. So I'll just I'll just sort and of talk I've got around a it, but. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a question for you. No, Mark is uh, starting. His please reading. keep going. I'm in no rush. Okay. No worries. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Samantha can ask them now, please. Ben, ben, I've got a question for you. So in, when you do the arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis, how you put your screws? What do you, you how, nowadays, when, how you put your screws? Uh, okay, first, uh, I, I must say I don't do a lot of uh, ankle arthrodesis. Uh, for me, if I do a uh, an arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis is really somebody with minimal deformity, no bone loss. It means something that's fairly easy to do. Um, I, I still prefer to put a home run screw. That means uh, in, in the front, I would have at least one medial screw. Uh, if I can get a lateral screw also, but then I also try to put a home run screw. That means uh, from postural lateral into the tailor neck. That's not that easy to put, but I think it gives a lot more stability. Because usually, I even in the video I showed you that I you want to go with one from the medial side, one from the lateral side. Uh, some yeah. of the when you do yeah. an ankle arthroscopic ankle, I do I do quite number of ankle arthros uh, I mean arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis because the advantage of arthroscopic is you are not destabilizing any ligaments on medial side and lateral side, so your stability yeah, is yeah. maintained. So the role of screw here is very minimal to just to compress the both talus and tibia. So we don't need to worry too much about the instability issues in arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis. That's why even the two screws from medium to lateral perpendicular to each other is more than enough. Uh, two questions here. One to Samantha. Uh, Dr. Nicholas wants to ask you, Samantha, would you put yes. a third screw from uh, fibula to talus? But I think uh, the answer has already been given by Sundar. Yes, yeah. yes sir. that's why I was asking. Yeah. Can the thing is that there are three. I, I will answer because Nicholas, sir, is a yeah, senior. That's the question to you, to, from Dr. Yeah, yeah. Nicholas. You can, you can give three ways the screws you can give. Uh -huh. Crisscross screws from medial side and lateral side of the tibia okay. to the talus, or okay. else you can see one screw from the medial side, one screw from a bit posterior through the fibula to the talus. And so that's his question fibula to talus. Fibula to talus. Another one, second, recently it has come, probably in 2012 or 13. You can go two screws both from the medial side. No. Okay. The okay. reason of that, people are telling that if you go from the lateral side, the, the tibia, then the removal of that screw is very difficult and sometimes you can hit the superficial peroneal nerve. So that's okay. why some people are now recommending that you can give two screws from the medial side of the tibia. Am I right, Tan? Yes. Actually, okay. most of the arthroscopic uh, people uh, actually put less screws, like what Sunarajan was saying. Yeah. 
uh, another question uh, i don't uh, anybody of the panel can answer when is osteotomy indicated in chronic lateral ankle instability so that's a question coming from dr mukul if anybody wants to answer that's a uh, interesting uh, question ipa yeah. so yeah you see uh, uh, quite a, a few of the patients with ankle instability would have a a, a, a varus hind foot or a cavus foot right yeah. so in those patients with in lateral instability with the with the cavus or a varus hind foot you i would rather i would also add a, a lateral closing wedge to a ligament reconstruction otherwise yeah. your repair will fail so i think that's one of the cases one of the indications for uh, doing a bony procedure yeah perfect i think ankle should be uh, the whole alignment should be kept in mind as well so if there is something which is actually uh, going to put pressure on the soft tissue reconstruction you might as well do an osteotomy to correct that ips uh, so mark thing, where are we ips just one thing i well, for we just have to go ahead with that uh, video so, so without um, video mark we could uh, just uh, maybe my first time doing zoom with video and uh i haven't really uh i didn't expect it not to work so i'm sorry about that no worries I've tried to google if anyone knows the answer please tell me but it's on an ipad so it might be different but nevertheless uh i can't get it to seem to get it to work but so look a lot of the things have been talked about anyway yeah so i'll just go over it again but uh this is uh really removing a, a bone uh from the uh, edge of the medial malleolus uh i i see a lot of play sports people with uh chronic instability and impingement and a lot of their impingement is over the anterior medial corner affecting the medial malleolus anterior medial tibia and talus so this is just another uh image going over the medial talus here and you can see that it's a very nice osteotome it has a single bevel and an angle which allows you to get in quite nicely to remove the bone mm, that one's not much good and this is uh removing a uh, spur from the anteromedial edge of the talus which is causing impingement and here uh after we've removed the major amount of bone we can smooth off the edges using a burr but unfortunately we didn't get much more of that um arthrofibrosis we saw before that is very useful to use an arthro wand this is very tough uh, tissue and to remove it with a shaver is very hard sometimes i even use a knife uh, just to break it up a little bit and use the arthro wand but you've got to be careful not to damage the articular surface another view of this and then sorry about that but really post operative care is usually uh pretty uh just relax for a couple of days just two or three days non weight bearing to prevent uh sinus formation let the swelling come down usually i i i just must have given this talk a long time ago because i don't use a drain anymore i used to for a few years but i don't ever drain the ankle and then um the main thing to be aware of is uh to, to i like patients to avoid uh doing uh closed lunge maneuvers for four weeks because this will um start to cause inflammation along the anterior part of the ankle and can promote some fibrosis so the main thing in the first few weeks i ask the patient is to just do um some open chain exercises walking and uh calf uh relaxation and massage and once the calf uh starts to lose its tension the movement comes back and you don't need to do anything remarkable to get the movement back it gradually returns over 8 to 9 weeks so they don't have to panic or have lots of physiotherapy for that then uh the other thing topic is why didn't the arthroscopy work well the main uh indication that i've seen in second opinions are that there's been insufficient clearance and this is mainly along the medial gutter so be careful for to look into the medial anteromedial gutter when you're doing a uh, anterior uh, debridement so you want to remove the spur in the front but also have a look down the medial and lateral gutters and then the other major cause is whether you've the inadvertently developed post operative arthrofibrosis 
and that is most often in my experience used due to aggressive physiotherapy or to uh, quick uh, return to sport. There's occasional patient where they have a genetic predisposition to arthrofibrosis and sometimes they need to be on medication uh, to uh, minimize that. Uh, and then beyond that, if it didn't work, there's probably another diagnosis that you've missed. And uh, firstly, the main one is to make sure that uh, you're not doing the, the debridement in the case where, the, where there is the disease is primarily osteoarthritis, or is there some other diagnosis, osteochondral disease, some ongoing instability, which you may have missed. And then some patients have, uh, have pain uh, over the uh, uh, navicular, where they may have an osteophyte or even a, a low grade stress fracture. And these need to be considered if they're still having pain, if you've not really worked it out. If they have arthritis fibrosis, uh, there is a, if patients have a, a very strong history, there's a very small indication in some cases to do some uh, injection of celestone at surgery, but it's usually an intramuscular injection away from the joint. Or, and then sometimes we may put patients on, on, um, uh, on some prednisolone for uh, one to two weeks, anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. and gentle mobilization with a, uh, a follow-up injection of four to six weeks if necessary. So that's my talk. Uh, I'm sorry about that with the, uh, with the videos. Uh, but I'm happy to take questions if need no be. No worries, Mark. There is a question, Mark. How often do you see recurrence of uh, such kind of bony uh, osteophyte forming again after excision? If you take it out adequately in rehab, it, that, then it's very, very rare to see it again. Very rare. And if you might see it, but you would virtually never need to reoperate on it. Uh, perfect. Uh, though we have not uh, covered osteochondral lesions too much in all our presentations, there are two questions coming up. Uh, how much is the role of an OATS procedure in ankle uh, osteochondral lesions? So, Mark, you have extensive experience in ankle. Uh, how yes, often do you do OATS? I, I don't ever do OATS procedure, unfortunately. Okay. So, I've, I, all, of my, all of my osteochondral disease, I've always treated with arthroscopic surgery. Uh -huh. I don't really do open uh, osteotomies or open graft, okay. but um, uh, we, for a long time, we did Macy graft and we've written yeah. papers on that and had excellent results. But uh, when, but uh, we can't do those now because of funding. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, but the majority of osteochondral lesions we treat with uh, microfracture and it's only the small percentage that needs something more. And now we have some more artificial products which we can use arthroscopically, such as uh, the one that we like now is called Joint Wrap, uh, but there is other ones uh, that uh, are used around the world as well. Uh, so if you can just undo your slide share so we can have our entire faculty oh, yeah. coming in here. Uh, two more questions coming up here. Uh, one question is regarding uh, the behavior of osteochondral lesion. So uh, we all are knee surgeons as well. I think most of them. How the osteochondral lesions of Taylor's dome differ from osteochondral lesions of the femoral condyle? So maybe we can start with Sundar. Your experience. So the Taylor, uh, uh, because it's a uh, the weight is a more constrained joint and it's a more weight bearing over the Taylor dome. So anything which is going more than one and a half centimeter or two centimeter lesions, eventually they'll have a bad prognosis. Eventually they'll go for arthritic changes. Um, uh, that's why the prognosis is bad when the lesion is bigger in uh, uh, ankle. Uh, like uh, answering to the previous question too, like you know, up to one centimeter or maximum you can go to 1.5, we do a microfracture. Anything more than that, then sometimes we can do the uh, BMAC procedure or on an ACA, which I could, even I don't do a warts. Recently okay. I had done one patient with osteotomy. I had to do a middle malleal osteotomy to go or see all around the uh, anteromedial a portion of the talus and did the BMAC procedure. But as I still, I counsel the patient still that I don't know because it's the only option available. Still the prognosis, you cannot guarantee that this will last for a long time. Uh, Dr. Ten, uh, your input about uh, osteochondral lesions of talus dome and how do you manage them? Uh, yes, I agree with uh, Sunarajan. 
uh, for me, I think really it's still quite a challenging area. It's unlike ligament surgery where the results are really quite good. Uh, so the success rate is a bit lower. Um, certainly if it's bigger or it's over the shoulder, patient is older, the success rate is uh, poorer. Um, unlike the others, I personally do not do an OATS too. I think it's really a secondary or even tertiary procedure. It means for a failed uh, microfracture. For my osteochondral lesions, I, I routinely will uh, do an arthroscopy and microfracture. And usually we augment it with some sort of scaffold, like uh, Dr. Blackney mentioned. So ACI is uh, not commonly done in your practice? The uh, no. Side implantation. Uh, yes, I uh, know. So usually we'll just do a microfracture and use a, a cartilage scaffold. Okay, okay. Perfect. I think uh, that's more or less end of the uh, questions here. Uh, so if there are no more questions, uh, we can uh, maybe uh, Pratik, you can just sum up and uh, we just have a minute and a half now left. Yeah, we have already shot. Uh, yeah, so I, I have one question. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, Ranjit. Yeah, is there any role of uh, intra regional dipomet role in chronic situations where you don't have any instability and only pain? And on examination, you will have tender point at the attachment of the lateral mellulus uh, of this ATFL. So after giving Depomedrol, uh, some of these patients, they do really very well. So is there any role of uh, giving uh, the Depomedrol to these kind of patients? Maybe I think it's you... an excellent idea. I think yeah. it works very well. Uh, yeah. And uh, something uh, that does help a lot of people with some localized synovitis or some scarring. So it's very well worth uh, doing. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I think, uh, 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 if Pratik, you can just uh, sum up and thank all the faculty and then we close it. It's already six. Thanks, friends. Uh, we've covered the ankle in this webinar quite comprehensively and every aspect was covered. In fact, Sundar, uh, uh, somebody's phone is ringing. Sorry, sorry. Okay, Sundarajan uh, covered very elegantly how to approach the ankle portals and do anterior arthroscopy. Made it easy for the people to start arthroscopy. While Dr. Kushal Nag showed us how posteriorly impingement can be actually tackled and how to select the patient because very important to select correct indications. Uh, Dr. Satish Sunar gave us uh, the uh, input into acute um, ankle injuries, which are very common actually, ATFL injuries, how to do arthroscopic bow strom elegantly. While Dr. Uh, Tan Jin actually covered uh, how to use an internal bracing when we have those patients who have slightly uh, lax or not so good tissues and how quickly to get them rehab, especially for our athlete. While Dr. Mark gave us uh, another view of how to do anterior arthroscopy and uh, you know look at the lesions and how why the arthroscopy fails. While most commonly seen by us, many of us here in uh, India is uh, art, uh, you know, arthrosis of ankle, ankle arthritis, which was covered by Dr. Samantha, how to actually uh, arthroscopically address it. So I wish to thank all the foreign faculty, Dr. Jantin and, uh, uh, and Dr. Mark, um, Blackney to spare their time and also to come and join us here, give us their inputs uh, and their experience and also the Indian faculty to come across uh, over to this webinar for IAS for a successful uh, meeting here. And also thank uh, the people, uh, Dr. Samantha and uh, Kushal Nag for putting it together and uh, IAS executive, which is working behind all these seminars, the 10th in a row uh, with a success. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pratik. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mark and Tim. And thank you very much. And Koshal, thank you. Thank uh, you, everybody. Thank you. Uh,